we go. That's probably a little better. You can hear me. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. We are uh, in a series entitled Unsettled. We're in week two right now. And why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because for many of you, and maybe you can relate to this, many people have felt very unsettled in parts of their faith, maybe a lot of their faith over the last couple of years have been a lot of things and circumstances that we've been through that maybe have caused you to question parts of your faith. Maybe some of you have doubled down and you feel like I'm stronger than I've ever been in my faith. Uh, That's awesome. Maybe this message series can help you help others. But for many of us, there have been times where you've questioned, you've doubted, what some people are calling deconstructing their faith, going through times of questioning stuff because of different things that they've been through. And if that is you or someone that you love, then you need to know you are in good company. Because after Jesus' resurrection, he has four individual conversations with four of some of his closest followers. And in each one of those uh, conversations, he addresses another popular, common misconception about faith that we all will struggle with at some time or another. And maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're struggling with it right now. And last week, we started with, chronologically, the first conversation with Mary Magdalene. If you missed that one, I encourage you to go check it out on our website. But this week, we're going to turn our attention to the next conversation, and that was with the most famous doubter in the Bible, Doubting Thomas, which was kind of interesting, because Thomas was one of the 12 disciples, yet he doubted. But his doubts were not without purpose. Thomas always doubted with a purpose. Thomas was a doubter, yes, but his doubts had a purpose because he always was wanting to know the truth. He was looking for what is the truth behind this. In, In other words, he didn't idolize his doubts. I think sometimes people today, and maybe you've fallen into this, I've known many people who have, sometimes we just fall into a default mode of doubting, 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 especially things of faith, because it makes us sound a little more intellectual, doesn't it? It makes you sound really smart when you go, well, I doubt that, you know. I've thought it all through, and it just doesn't make sense. And so it, it, it kind of is this smoke screen of not really having to deal with it. But one thing that we see with Thomas is that he was always willing to say, no, I'm going to step into this awkward, difficult, doubting, unsettled phase of my faith and work through it. And I hope that you're inspired by that today, and maybe that'll help you. And to put it another way, doubting was only his way of responding, not his way of life. It wasn't a permanent condition of his soul or his heart. That like I am just the kind of person that just always doubts no matter what. That is just not true of Thomas. As a matter of fact, we really owe a lot of respect. We should show a lot of respect towards Thomas and his faith. He was a man who was very loyal. He was very honest. Very honest about his doubts and very honest about where he was in his faith. As a matter of fact, it was Thomas who really shows us there were times where He stuck with what he knew to be a fact, even when his emotions probably were fighting with him, right? That he was like, no, I'm committed, no matter how hard this is for me emotionally. There was a time as the uh, the 12 disciples were following Jesus, that Jesus, uh, as some of you, if you've ever read through any of the Gospels, um, that as his ministry grew, his life became threatened more and more. And there was a time where he's being invited to go back to this little town called Bethany. And the last time he was in the Bethany vicinity in that area, they wanted to kill him, okay? So the disciples knew, we don't need to go back to that neighborhood. Like, they have it out for you. Let's not do this. It was very obvious that Jesus' life is in danger. And anybody who's following Jesus, they're, they're threatened with death as well. But it was Thomas who spoke up and said that what probably some of the other disciples were thinking, but they didn't say it. Thomas was the one who said it. He says, let us go, in other words, he's referring to Bethany, that we may die with him. That if our end is going to be death, Jesus had already said, I'm going back to Bethany, guys. Either you're coming with me or you're staying here, but I'm going. 
And Thomas is saying, if it means death, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I would be, rather be with Jesus in a life-threatening situation than without Jesus in a nice, safe, according to my estimation anyway, nice, safe situation that's non-threatening and is not going to cause me to um, grow at all. <laughs> it's not going to cause me to be challenged at all. And this was where he was. He was always willing to step out. And he was willing to follow Jesus even when he didn't know the way to wherever Jesus was. We see this in John chapter 14. This was a short time before the crucifixion. Jesus had gathered up his disciples and he was explaining to them something really important here. At the beginning of chapter 14, he was saying, now listen guys, I'm about to go away, okay? But it's important that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he's talking about heaven so that you may be able to come and be where I am, and you will know the way. And Thomas speaks up and says what probably everybody's thinking, but Jesus, how do we know the way? How do we know how to get to where you are? We don't know the way. We have no idea. And because of that question from Thomas, we got this beautiful passage in the New Testament 14, 6, chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, where Jesus says, but Thomas, and he's speaking right to Thomas, I am the way, and I'm the truth, and I am the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. And if you know me, you know the Father. And if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It's one of those times where Jesus unequivocally shows that he is God in the flesh. And it came because Thomas, doubting Thomas, was willing to ask the question. Over and over, we see throughout this story that Jesus does not reject doubts that are honest and directed towards belief. I want you to see this as we go through his story, and even through this conversation with Thomas, as we're going to look at this post-resurrection conversation with Thomas. That Jesus wasn't like anti-doubts or questions, especially when those questions and those doubts were, were seeking truth. They were seeking faith. Like they want, I want to believe Jesus. And I will believe, I am willing to believe if truth can be revealed to me. If it can be shown to me, you got me, right? Jesus was like, I can work with that. That Bring that kind of doubt to me. That's what I'm looking for. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look in John chapter 20, starting with verse 24. Now this story is picking up the night of the first Easter, OG Easter, if you will, okay? The night of Resurrection Sunday, okay? So let's just keep that in your mind, and here's how things begin to transpire. Verse 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So Jesus came in among the twelve disciples that evening, so it was the, the evening of the first Easter, but Thomas wasn't there. So some biblical historian, commentator, writers, some of the best explanations that I found on this was that Thomas was the kind of guy, and some of you guys in the room might, might be able to relate with this, he was so taken aback and distraught over Jesus' death that he had to just go get alone to come to terms with it. Like, I just got to be alone. Guys, I'll see you later. I just need to go take a walk. I need to go out in the woods. I need to just be, I just need to be quiet for a little bit and just think about what just happened. Oh my gosh. You would talk about rocking his world. And that night, Jesus shows up. So it seems to be a little bit later that evening, Thomas shows back up with the uh, remaining disciples and here's what they say to him. Verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. You won't believe it, Thomas. You can't, I mean, like, you, you just missed, he was just here. Like, we, we just saw him, you can't even believe it. He, he, he was, Jesus was up walking around, and he looked really good, by the way. I mean, like, amazing, better than he's ever looked before. And what was Thomas's response? Thomas's response, and he says to the he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
In other words, I think we can read into Thomas's remarks. Listen, guys, don't do this to me. Don't get my hopes up. This is too painful. It's too hard. It's too disappointing. I, I, I don't, 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 don't try to fool me into believing something that's not true. And in this moment, Thomas is sort of a stand-in for every other skeptic in the world today or who has ever lived. Because here's what he does. He says, here are my conditions for faith. Here are my conditions for belief. If they are met, then yes. If I can take my little finger and put it right where those Roman soldiers drove nails through Jesus' wrist and through his hand and into the wood, yeah. If I can take my little hand and I can put it where that Roman spear was thrust into Jesus' side while he was on the cross, and I can feel the wound or its scar, then yes, I'll believe. He had very specific doubts, very specific qualifiers and identified areas that he's like, I want to make sure that I'm not believing in some kind of imposter. You got to credit the guy for that. I'm trying to not believe in some ghost or I don't know what you guys saw, but I just can't, I can't believe it. Because based on what Thomas understood about a Roman crucifixion, and I'm sure that he had seen many in his lifetime, no average human being could have endured that level of brutality and those kinds of wounds and kind of uh, subject their body to that kind of brutality and live. No average person could have done that. Even if 10 of his closest friends came to him and begged him saying, Thomas, you got to believe this. He was really here. You know anybody that's like that? That's like that big of a skeptic that even 10 of their friends could not convince them, right? Well, I still don't believe it. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't know about that. Maybe that's you. You're just naturally a little suspicious and a little suspect of what other people's motives and what they're saying. And it's just, and it's sometimes when you, sometimes that creeps its way into your faith and it's just really difficult at times. And if that is you, here's the question that you probably grappled with before, and I'm going to go ahead and ask it on your behalf. So how do we move forward? Do we just stay stuck in our doubts? Do we just stay unsettled in our faith forever? Is that just what we're destined and cursed to, to live our life out like that? Is there a way forward? In other words, now, we need to take a moment and take a cue from Thomas. And here's the cue I want you to take from Thomas. Thomas shows us right here, it is better to doubt out loud than to disbelieve in silence. Better to doubt out loud. You got to credit the guy and, and respect him for the fact that he processes it out loud with his Christian friends with the body of believers that existed at that time. Guys, I'm just not buying it. I'm struggling to believe what you're telling me. And here are my qualifiers. Here are the things that I'm really struggling with. And let me just tell you right now, this is just human behavior. This is, this is our knee-jerk reaction. When you start to doubt your faith, when you go through those seasons where it's just really hard and something's happened with your family, something's really challenged your faith, there is part of you that won't want to step back. I'm just not going to go to church right now because I don't really know what I believe. Can I just tell you right now, that is like the worst decision you could make. It's the worst decision. And I, I promise you, and we talked about this the first couple of uh, months of this year, you have a spiritual enemy that is trying to divide you from the body of Christ, divide you from God, trying to create a wedge. So, of course, he would love that. The devil wants to keep you away from the things of God and the people of God. But there is a power that, that Thomas finds by stepping forward and saying, hey, everybody, you may hate me for that. You may not like this, but I don't believe what you believe, at least right now. <laughs> I'm struggling with this. It's hard for me. I know all of you got to see something I didn't, and it just you jumped on board quickly, but it's just I am struggling with this. And that might be where you are right now, ladies and gentlemen. And that's okay. 
And the beautiful thing is, this was not the end of the story. One week later, there's another visit that happens. We're told in verse 26, verse 26 of chapter 20, he says, it says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. So this time, Thomas was present. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you, because I'm sure at that moment, they were like, whoa, 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 ah, ooh, ah. I mean, he literally, I mean, this is the Bible showing us Jesus just teleported into the room. He thought about it, and then he was there. Wow, that's incredible. And again, this is Jesus basically just saying, hey, get a load of this. Body 2.0. For those who are my followers, transformed, perfected, beautiful, like you get one of these two. The Apostle Paul tells us that, that when we see him, either in his, uh, the, the rapture of his return or when we appear in heaven, we will be like him of the same stuff of Jesus. We will have a body like that. And he's showing us, and you're going to like these. It, it doesn't wear out. It doesn't get sick. It's always healthy. It's strong. It's great. It's awesome. It never gets overweight. And also it teleports. That's nice too. <laughs> Incredible. Just a little side note there. So here Jesus stands among them. And he's like, kind of like, ta-da. <laughs> I heard a story this week about a little girl whenever um, she was being told the Easter story and said, when the stone was rolled away and the first witnesses showed up and then the angel said, and she said, ta-da. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Jesus jumped out and said, ta-da. But anyway, that's not what he said. But he does turn in, the, in that moment towards the doubter in the room, to Thomas, and extends his hand out. And here's what he says. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it, uh, put it into my side. And let's say this highlighted words together. Stop doubting and believe. Now, you need to understand the heart behind this. This is not Jesus getting on to him. How dare you doubt? <laughs> no, it was like Jesus is saying, I see you stuck, Thomas. I love you too much. I got too many wonderful things in store for you. You can't be just stuck in your faith for the rest of your life. You can't just be immobilized. You can't just be paralyzed by your own doubt. I want to help you. It's time to move on. There's beautiful things and wonderful things in store for you. you gotta, but you got to take a step. you got to trust me. Come to me. you got to start to stop doubting and start believing. Trust me. And that is exactly what Thomas does. It's beautiful. In this moment, Jesus helps him to see that, first of all, Thomas had a list of identified doubts. Now, if you've never identified your doubts, like, okay, here are my big issues. I have some people I know that there's just sort of nebulous doubts. Well, you know, the whole thing just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, nail it down. Figure out what is it you really have a problem with. Well, I just have this weird feeling. Well, where's the feeling coming from? Find out, because if you don't know what your doubts are, how are you going to know when God answers them, when he addresses them? And he may very well do that through another Christian, through his word, through prayer, through a book you're reading, an article. He might do it through a, a number of different things, but if you don't know to be looking, you'll miss it. But Jesus answers the direct identified doubts of Thomas. And the next thing that we realize about Jesus, and this is brilliant, is that Jesus reveals the fact that he was right there with Thomas all along. It wasn't like a disciple that pulled Jesus, you know, he's like, peace be with you. Hang on just a second. Jesus, come here. Thomas, like a week ago, was doubting you even resurrected. Can you believe that? Okay, go ahead and talk to him, you know. No, it wasn't. It didn't go down like that. Jesus already knew. He already knew. You know how he, why? How he already knew? Because he has always been with Thomas. And he's with you too. He knew his doubts. And he's like, Thomas, come here. Let me help you. We're going to move past this. 
I want to help you to get strong in your faith. I don't want you to be stuck in it anymore. I want you to be able to have the evidence that you need. And in that moment, Thomas begins to realize that the real evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not to just show off his raw supernatural power, although it did that for sure. The real power behind the resurrection was that it displayed God's immense love and forgiveness for sin and death that the sin will bring to all of us without Jesus. In other words, if we could put Jesus' words Uh, put them slightly differently. This is what I believe Jesus was at the heart of Jesus' statement to Thomas. He was saying, my wounds were not simply evidence that I'm alive. They are proof that I died for you, Thomas. That your debt, your debt, your sin debt is fully paid. And that the power of death over you is broken You're a free man. And for the first time, Thomas is like, oh my gosh. Oh my God. Really? Because the next thing that comes out of his mouth is, my Lord, my God. It's the next thing. You see him going from one of the lowest lows of the whole New Testament in terms of his doubt to the highest proclamation of faith we see anywhere in the Gospels. Beautiful, because he got it in that moment. Here's the other thing that's kind of brilliant, is that we do not see any proof from the text that Thomas ever actually laid his hands on Jesus. He never actually put his finger in the scar and his hand in the side. When he heard Jesus' truth, when he spoke to him, he, re- he realized the truth was evident to him. This is Jesus. He knows me, and I know him, and I can trust him. He's real, and I can trust him right now. And for those of you who are struggling through doubt, and you're right there right now, as you are willing to take even just little baby steps in that process to move forward in faith, here's what you're going to realize. You're going you're to realize that the God that you're coming to know is not a passive God. He is alive. He is risen. And he is seeking you. He is coming after you. He loves you. And just like Thomas, you will realize all those seasons of your life when you were questioning and doubting and unsettled in your faith, he was right there with you. And he loved you anyway, despite your doubts and your fear and your failures and your backsliding and your false promises that you never made good on. He's like, despite all that, come on over here. I love you. I got you. I'm here for you. And I love that the next thing that Jesus says here, he says to him, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. In other words, Jesus is showing us right here, and I love this, that you don't have to see me with your own physical eyes to have powerful, life-changing, resurrection faith in Jesus that you can do and we can do, all of us can do, the same thing that Thomas did. You see, how did he start out believing the resurrection? He had to to rely on the eyewitness testimony of other people who had seen the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus is showing us, like he showed Thomas, you can trust the eyewitnesses. You can trust the eyewitnesses. That you can come to a place where you realize, just like Thomas did, that the power of the resurrection isn't just a display of supernatural power by Jesus, but rather the power of the resurrection is that Jesus has come and he defeated sin and death, and not just sin and death, your sin and death, my sin and death. That your personal sin and the death that you deserved and that I deserved, Jesus took upon himself. And when we believe that, that changes our life just like it did Thomas. 
It changes us. It transforms us. And it makes us cry out just like he did, my Lord and my God. I get it now. I may not have all the answers, but I got enough. I can take a step forward. I can begin to move forward. And the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is formidable. It absolutely is. But we find ourselves in that same place that Thomas did. We have to trust the New Testament testimonies of the eyewitnesses who were actually there. And that what they wrote was true, historical fact that we can trust and we can bank our life on that. Now, just in case you're saying, well, I, that'd be great, Will, if I had maybe a little bit more history, a little bit more verification that the history of the New Testament was believable and trustworthy. Now, I want to give you, I, there's lots of books that I could recommend, but for those of you who are like, I really want to deep dive into this and know a little bit more, I want to recommend one wonderful book to you by Dr. N.T. Wright called The Resurrection of the Son of God. There it is up there. Um, and it's a brilliant work, and one of the unique things about Dr. Wright is that he starts with all of the extra-biblical historical material and works his way in, showing you how that the New Testament writers were authenticated as actual historical fact and then works his way all the way down to the resurrection event itself helping us to be able to see that you don't get the kind of world that we have and the kind of history that we have without a resurrection. The ripple effect of that, all the way down to today, that we as Americans are outraged when people get their civil rights violated, when people are treated unjustly and unfairly. Where do you think that came from? He said that is an exclusively Jesus teaching. You don't get that anywhere else in, in all of history. Like, there's so many things like that he, he talks about. So I just encourage you, check out the book. I'll warn you now, it's about 900 pages. It's huge, but brilliant. If you really want the backstory, he's got it, okay? Beautiful. Um, and I just want to encourage you, as we think about the question, what are your conditions in order to believe today? What are yours? You need to identify them. If you don't know what they are, how are you going to know when God addresses them and helps you to move past them? What are those things for you? And if you're a believer today, what are the conditions that have caused you to kind of throw on the brakes and say, I don't know if I can trust God with whatever area that you have been very reluctant to trust God? How do we move forward in faith Maybe it is you're a single person, you're like, yeah, well, I trust God with a lot of areas, but I don't really want Jesus messing with my dating life. I'm really having a lot of fun there, and I don't want Jesus' you know, truth and his principles guiding me there. Well, let me just tell you, you've got to play the movie, right? There's consequences to every behavior, and there's a reason why Jesus said what he did. It's inviting Jesus into the middle of your marriage if you're married. Maybe you're reluctant to do that. I don't even know what that means, and that sounds kind of scary. There are resources. There's ways to, to understand what that means. Maybe it's, I don't really trust God with my money. He can have everything else, but don't put your hands on my money, God. I don't want to trust him with that. What is that for you? What is it that you're like, mm, you know, I know you created the world and me and everything else, and I can trust all that, but there's certain things, nope, off limits. No, thank you, God. I know better. In other words, I'm going to be my own savior in this particular area. Good luck with that, right? That's going to lead into some heartbreak. Learning how to move beyond your doubts and your conditions, it explodes and opens up your faith like a beautiful flower. It allows you to begin to say, okay, I see these facets of your power in my life that I never saw before. And this is what Thomas shows us. Thomas shows us that we can doubt without living a life uh, of doubting, a, a doubting way of life. That we can have doubts without the doubts overcoming our lives. And what's beautiful about that is that doubts are actually good. Doubts cause us to rethink things, to ask questions and seek answers. But doubts cannot be a permanent location of your life. It can't be a permanent condition of you spiritually. You've got to learn how to move forward. A great analogy is to think about doubting is kind of like, okay, I've lifted my foot and I'm about to take a step forward. 
but I'm just hovering here. Until I decide, until I commit, there's no forward mo motion. There's no progress being made. There's no growth happening. But this is what it means to walk with Jesus, to take each step, and I'm going to trust you with this, and I'm going to trust you with this, and I'm going to trust you with this. It's learning to trust him at each step, and when we do, it begins to open us up to a level of faith we didn't even know existed. It's beautiful. It's awesome. And this is what the resurrection unlocks for us, that there is a way of living past our doubts that have many of us paralyzed here in the room. And another beautiful encouragement that you may find is that there have been some brilliant, some of the most brilliant people who have ever lived, Christians, who have written about their doubts and their struggles throughout the last couple of thousand years. Far more brilliant than people give them credit for. And you may read some of the things that they have written and say, oh my gosh, this is such encouragement to me. And you may read and say, I didn't even know to doubt that, but my goodness, they're right. And here's the answer. And it will help to support and strengthen your faith by expressing those doubts out loud and letting the body of Christ, the body of believers, be a part of that growth and strengthening process and I encourage you to, to share those with, a, with your small group. Share those with a, a member of the body of Christ. Share those with a staff member here at Brazos Fellowship that we might be able to help you, help you with resources, help you to take that next step. In other words, silent doubts rarely find answers. Silent doubts just begin to rot inside of us. It doesn't give life. It just begins to take over more and more of our life so that everything starts to be questioned. And I just want to encourage you to move. There's a way to move forward with confidence with the Lord. It's learning how to share it, to, to have the confidence to share it with the body of Christ, share it with God, and be open to Him helping us to take those steps forward. Now here's the application prayer. I'm asking you to pray with me today, simply saying, God, help me to process my doubts out loud with others. So I'm including God. God, help me to do this. And I'm going to share this. I'm going to have the boldness, the courage, just like Thomas did, to process it with believers. I want to stop doubting and believe the very challenge that Jesus gave to Thomas. This is the way forward. This is the way unto life eternal, abundant life that Jesus came to give. It is learning to trust and to step forward. Where do you need to do that today? Where is God asking you, are you ready to trust me with this? I know you're scared. Everybody that's going to step out of the paralyzing doubt of their past is scared. Everybody is. Me, and we all are. But are you willing to stay in that paralyzed fear, or are you willing to move forward with him? Would you bow with me in prayer right now and give it over to him? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your beautiful words for some of the most painful and frustrating parts of our spiritual life when we struggle with doubts. And I pray, God, right now, all across the room, you know who you are. Would you just bring your doubts to him? God, here's where I've been getting stuck. I can't figure it out. I don't know. And by the way, God doesn't necessarily owe us the full explanation so that we understand everything he's doing, but at least to have the truth so that we can move forward. We're going to have to trust him. Faith has to be exercised. But would you right now just say, God, I, I bring before you my doubts. I bring before you those areas of my spiritual life that have caused some friction They've caused me to question. They've caused me some heartache. I give it to you right now. Are you here right now and you know that God's saying, you need to give that to me. You need to hand it to me. If you're, if you're right now trusting God with some doubt in your life, would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you right now. Anybody here? I'm trusting God with something that has caused all kinds of issues for me. God bless you in the balcony and on the floor. Father, thank you so much. I pray, Father, that you would just help all those who are saying, yeah, this is tough. It's been difficult. God, I need your help. I want to proceed forward, but it's scary, God. 
but despite my fear and despite my emotions, I'm going to go with what I know to be true, just like Thomas did. God, I pray that right now we would trust you with the tension that's been in our heart, maybe for years, and that we're willing right now to say, God, I'll take that step with you. I'll trust you. With what I understand, I will trust you. I'm going to take a step with you right now. Would you just tell him that? I'm going to begin to move forward with you in this relationship, with my finances, with my marriage, with my kids, with my job, with my future. Would you just tell him that right now? We trust you, God. You are worthy. And would you just say to him, you are my Lord and my God. And no one else and nothing else can take your place. You may lower your hands. And God, I pray right now for any person who can hear my voice online, here and live in the room. God, where there is a question in their heart, I don't know where I stand with God. I have doubts. I don't even know if I'm a child of God. I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I don't know where I stand in my faith. I want to help you to take a step past all that doubt today so that you will know that you have eternal life. Would you pray right where you sit? Just say, Jesus, I'm inviting you into the middle of my life right now. I'm asking you to forgive all my sin and the death that is deserved because of the sin. Thank you for forgiving my sin and setting me free. I follow you as the Lord of my life from this day forward. If you just prayed that prayer, asking Jesus to forgive your sin and be the Lord of your life, would you just boldly, as an act of faith right now, lift your hand? I would love to pray for you. And if you're online right now, just click, I have accepted Christ. I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Anybody here, God bless you. Right over here, right back over here. God bless you, ma'am. Anybody up in the balcony, give my life totally to Jesus, holding nothing back. God bless you right over here. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We celebrate you. We exalt your name for you have the power to change lives. You have the power to break the paralysis, the hold of doubt and fear that has held people down, has shackled them back from life that you have come to give them, the abundant life for too many years. And today is the day, our emancipation day, a freedom day to walk out of the prison cell of doubt and begin to walk out into the sunshine of faith and belief and trust in you, Jesus, and find that you are right there with us all the time. We love you, we praise you, and we pray it all in the incredible name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Next week, if you've ever blown it so bad, you're wondering if God could ever use you, you gotta hear Peter's story. We'll see you back next week. Break somebody with you. See you then.